the Sports Vote Campaign Podcast. Invest in sports. Hello and welcome back. Today is Sunday, March 27th, 2022, and this is the Sports Vote Campaign Update Podcast. Always refer to the show notes for up-to-date links and a link to the raw outline that creates each episode if you're interested, which also contains links most of the time. So you, uh, a couple of notes. You must be holding the sports shares of any given team at the point the dividends are paid, whether that's by the game or quarterly, and this can range from a few minutes to a, several hours after the qualifying event, the end of the game or the end of the quarter. So <clears throat> always verify the expected dividends have been paid before selling. One government agency, the SEC, tries to destroy ASM, while another, the SBA, comes along and supports it and stands as a 30-year defense against an injustice perpetrated against me more than a decade ago. The message here, God is real. So the I-bonds, the Treasury I-bonds are now paying over 7%. This is just a uh, an, something to look at if you have some uh, savings account money you want to park in a high-return inflation beating rate. Uh, these are U.S. Treasury bonds, the I-series. They just went over 7% because it's indexed to inflation. It's $10,000 a year. Uh, $10,000 a year for an individual, $20,000 for a couple. And I believe you can get paper uh, I-bonds beyond that from your tax refund um, for another $5,000 per person or $10,000 per uh, couple. You're not going to find a 7% return, uh, guaranteed return anywhere. In fact, uh, most savings accounts, even with the Fed rate increase, I mean, it still pays less than 1%, um, some far less than 1%. Foreclosures have jumped 70% uh, so far this year. That's a lot. There's going to be uh, six more rate hikes this year by the Fed, and each one of those is going to send the mortgage rates up per- faster than the, the actual hike itself. That's already happened. Uh, 30-year rates are going up almost every day now. So I made a prediction last summer that the uh, housing market would uh, come start coming apart this summer. I stick with that. Um, The February pending home sales sank, and uh, you're starting to see. uh, Well, first I'm seeing uh, for sale signs popping up everywhere. I've seen this before in 2008. And um, also the people who have approved loans are starting to back away from those and not close the transactions, which means they're all, you know, right there at the table and they, they change their mind. That's, uh, that's uh, also a very bad indicator because uh, they've gone through the whole process. Um, you cannot have a 20% run up in housing prices in a year. That's, this is all inflation. There's no way around it. Um, they printed trillions of dollars out of thin air and housing leads the inflation curve and now it spills over into energy, food, and everything else. This is exactly what's happening. Um, this is driven by programs and all these trillions of dollars. Um, there's not real production backing up these inflated prices. And unless they come up with, with another reason to print more trillions of dollars, uh, this is a trap. And it's just a matter of time before it, it, it gets sprung. So inventory is being held off the market artificially with eviction programs, eviction prevention programs. That's if you watch, especially in California, you watch the the uh, California, New York, watch how that goes. But there's others around the country. So you have a lot of inventory that's tied up in that, uh, which is holding the demand up um, artificially. Interest rates are going up fast and there's no way around it. They have to keep increasing them because inflation is spiraling out of control. Frankly, there was no way for it to be any other way because I'll get to that in a second, a discussion of inflation. Um, Buyers are, are, like I said, backing away from approved loans, meaning they're coming to their senses at the last minute that, hey, hold on a second, this is insanely high. Work from home is not going away. Uh, There has been a typical, you know, human behavior, people forget so soon, of going back to the cities because of the things, you know, the things that the city brings a lot of people like, but that's uh, causing the prices to spike way out of uh, hand, especially in in the more popular big metro areas. And people are soon going to find out that they don't need to or or can't afford to pay these prices, and uh, they'll move back out again because they don't have a choice. Um, Inflation outside of housing is rising very, very fast, and, and gas prices are eating people alive. 
and they can't afford big house payments. I don't see a case for continuing with price increases. I think that's all puffery coming from the real estate industry, obviously. And the wheels are coming off, just like I said they would when I said they would. I said almost a year ago that it would be in the summer, and um, just watch the headlines. It'll play out like a script. Now, why? This is not about um, a brief discussion about inflation. So what causes inflation? Well, in this case, it was pretty obvious because they told us what they were doing. Uh, they literally create money out of thin air. The Federal Reserve does. There's some convoluted, more technical things that go on, like talking about the Fed's balance sheet and all that. But just suffice it to say, uh, they print it up. <laughs> so most of it and uh, some of it they borrow back from the people which is kind of what they're doing with these i bonds which is crazy seven percent they're like the sba is loaning it out at 3.75 fixed for 30 years which is less than a 30-year mortgage and then you turn around and you uh, have a six-month uh, bond rate of seven percent i mean that's a recipe for bleeding cash like no tomorrow uh, it's literally twice um you're paying out twice what you're getting back is just nuts. But those are all too too technical for this conversation. Just suffice it to say that you have, um, they printed up, people were not working. So just go through the basic mechanics of it. You, you froze out a lot of businesses, the entire sports world shut down, for example, for about a year. You mothballed everything. And then you put all these programs in place that either grant or loan money out by the trillions, many trillions. Um, I said that it would be about a year's GDP when it's all said and done. Um, when you look back over the numbers, you're going to see that they basically inflated everything by 100%. Um, so we're starting to see the beginning of that inevitable uh, result. You know, It's not all going to show up at once. That's not how it happens, especially with the dollar, because it's all over the world. So basically the entire world gets to sop up our inflation because they have our dollars in their banks. But they basically doubled the money supply, but they did double the production. So it's it's sort of like, um, you know, you, you if you think of it simply, um, money is nothing in and of itself. And I can make a whole lifetime worth of podcasts just talking about that. But Money represents basic, basically potential energy, you know, work being done in some direction. When you just print it up out of thin air and give it to people, um, that's not happening. So you have people sitting at home because you forced them to stay home. There is no movement. You know, for example, in Los Angeles, the I'll never forget as long as I live going out and seeing the freeway space, you know, essentially empty. So there's no production going on, but yet you're still paying for everything. So you're paying for it by printing more currency, which is nothing more than a vehicle for activity, economic activity. So there's no there's no way around that becoming inflationary. It's just not, it's a basic, uh, you know, one plus one equal two kind of an equation. But they have to arrest it somehow. So with the interest rates being so low for so long, um, that's made the situation worse. And really the only tool they have to slow this down, which they have to now because it's bleeding over into gasoline. Of course, they're blaming that on Russia, but I don't buy that. Um, it starts in housing because uh, everybody needs a place to live, right? So that's a universal demand. And then it starts going over into um, uh, gasoline and food, right? Well, gasoline is um, food for your car, right? So when you start moving around, you're going to burn gasoline and then you have food itself, so that's what you're seeing. Uh, and then the last places it goes is, uh, you know, non-essential things, but it'll, it'll hit the essentials first. Um, so they have to increase interest rates. And by, when they do that, um, it brings to anybody that's been, you know, ever had a mortgage knows that every little tick up in the interest rates has a huge impact on your monthly payment, especially when houses are, what, $300,000 average now in that range. So it gets uh, pushes up real fast, and people's budgets are, are squeaky tight, and a lot of those budgets are still based upon either funds that they got from various programs, or maybe they saved up some of that money, or maybe the employer that they're working for has been able to keep them going from the paycheck program and all that. All of that stuff is coming into expiration now. So um, yeah, so that's, that's basically it. So uh, that's why there's just no, unless they start printing money again, and I just 
don't see the political will for that, and especially coming into the uh, midterms at the, at later on this year, it's almost guaranteed that the uh, sh- balance of power is going to shift back to the right, and it's going to shift back to the right very hard. This is just the way it goes. The first uh, two years of any new administration, they get kicked back very hard the other direction, and I think you know it's almost a guarantee that all the congressional control is going to go back to the Republican side, and they're not going to go into this. Um, even, I don't even see under the worst of situations where they're going to go into money printing again. That's not that's not going to it's not politically viable for them. So a war, <laughs> you know, that's that creates real production. But yet we're not yet to get really involved in it directly. But it wouldn't be the first time that if we did that it was a reason to kick the economy back up. Um, you know, I pray to God that's not the reason and that that doesn't happen. That's not good for anybody. Uh, to have the big gorilla in the room come into the into the fracas, but um, you know it might be. I mean that that that's been done before to pull us out of economic dumps. It's either that or you run the presses again because there's not nearly enough production to back all of this money flying around. This is a this would be a hyperinflation case if it wasn't for the fact that dollars is the reserve currency at least for for now of the world. Um, if we were a sovereign nation with our own currency inside our borders, we'd already have hyperinflation. But uh, because we're internationalized our dollar, that was pretty clever, although I'm not sure it was intentional. It was more people wanted the dollar because they believed in in the in what we had and they felt it was the safest thing going. Um, I don't I don't think it was really a flat out plan, but it worked out that way. So the result is the whole world sops up our uh, our mistakes and our and our benefits and our mistakes and our inflation. So we export our inflation is what I'm getting at. But there's been so much of this money printing going on, and it ha- has also happened in the other countries as well. So everybody ran the presses hard. And this is just a case for worldwide inflation. And in the case of the dollar, probably inflation like we have never seen. It, I, at least in my lifetime, haven't seen it at all. They're talking about the, um, the 1980s period, I think, but I think this is worse than that. I think this is already getting, I said on the last uh, 70s podcast, 15%, but I it could be even maybe 18% at this point. It's very, very high, and there's no, there's no case for it coming down um, at this moment. So with housing, um, that's a, prick, a bubble that's uh, set to pop, and there, I just can't see how it sustains on this track. There's, there's every single... Uh, Input is wrong, is going the wrong direction. So, you know, I think you're going to see, I don't know how hard it'll crash, but it's going to crash. I just can't see another case. So back to production. So what does all this mean for ASM? Well, at the end of the day, the, the economy needs new production. It needs a new type of production, not just a new production of the same old thing. It's not going to come from gambling, folks. Gambling is a shell game. It's two people sitting across a table from each other trying to trick each other out of the same dollar. Let's be honest. That's what gambling is. It's it's not a productive use of capital. It doesn't produce anything. It just skims money out, okay? That's all it does. There is no real production taking place. It is just a mathematical trickery game, con job between uh, you know the, the gambler and the house, right? And, and let's see who can grab the dollar from who, right? Back and forth and back and forth. And each time they take a little piece of it. Um, that's not production. That's a con. However, if you build sports industry in a way never done before, where the public has a piece of it and you can ground up new leagues in any place, basically any place that has an internet uh, connection, so with Elon's project, along with the other guys doing satellites and all the urban, I'm sorry, the rural expansion that's going on, that's going to be every place on the globe not very, in, not, in the not-too-distant future. So what we need is a new sports economy. I make the case that I, same thing I've said for 20 years, you know, not quite 20 years, but it's getting close, that that's what you have here. You want new production? Put it into a new sector in sports, not into gambling cons, not into trickery, not into that garbage, which has been known for, I mean, it's been known for, you can go back thousands of, gambling in its core has wrecked a lot of civilizations. It's a, humanity doesn't seem to learn 
from, uh, I saw a quote not too long ago that said, the one thing we learn from humanity is that humanity doesn't learn from the history. And something to that effect. And boy, is that true. Um, so anyhow, um, new sports economy, new sports industry on the ground, anywhere there's an internet connection, a way for the public to build an ecosystem off of that, um, carve out their little piece of the new sports economy, sort of like people have done with eBay and Amazon and all that, and then just build up uh, athletics too. I mean, it's not just the money side of it. It's the health side of it. It's the getting outside side of it, all that. So, um, you know, I'm going to keep saying the same thing because it's true. Okay. The new sports economy would, would definitely make a difference in this situation. If it were alive right now, it would already be sopping up the, uh, the liquidity out there and it would be creating new opportunities that would already have been happening. So once again, it comes down to one thing, and frankly, I don't think that's going to happen until the SEC case is resolved. Uh, I get that. That seems to be the, the, the thing that's holding us back. So those people who are responsible uh, for, for making that happen, and you know who you are, and you will be found out eventually. There's no way around it. So be prepared to answer to the other 950 people, roughly uh, 900 and something odd people that had no part in that. They're all going to know who you are because I'm going to make sure of it. Okay? So... Um, Throwing, uh, throwing rocks and sand and then hiding your hand, yeah, it's not going to work out. Uh, it didn't work out, it isn't going to work out, and it will not work out in the future. However, all that being said, we're moving along piece by piece to resolve that, and I think that once, let me, res- let me, let me restate that. I know that once that's resolved, the major impediment is removed. Um, that's the trigger for Alper to take over, and I think it's also the trigger for us to find a taker like the NRHL deal, which was uh, sabotaged <laughs> by an insider. Um, once that um, that is that happens again, and this time it's successful, and there's no SEC overhang, then um, the fuse will be lit, and all these things, which I've been saying for almost two decades, will come to pass. So, thank you for your time. And again, if you um, you want to keep up with the other materials and things. It's always in the show notes along with the raw outline for each episode. Thank you and have a nice day. I'll speak with you again in two weeks.